let's embrace that. Oh, hello. Um, welcome to Journalism is for Everyone. It is the link CSU orientation workshop. Um, we have prepared a PowerPoint. We're gonna talk to you about um, why you might wanna get involved in journalism, um, in student journalism, particularly with the link, obviously, um, being that that is us. And um, we're also going to tell you a little bit about what you need to know to get involved with journalism. And basically, hopefully what we intend to show you is that it's easier than you might think to use skills that you have um, in order to do this. Um, in my case, um, this is my second time in university. I went to Ryerson um, several years ago. And at that time I was interested in this kind of thing, but I was intimidated. Um, I really didn't realize how easy it was to get involved. Um, so that's what we want to show you. Um, if I haven't mentioned it, cause I'm not sure, I am the editor in chief of this fine publication. And my colleagues here will probably take this moment to also introduce themselves. Hi, uh, my name's Elias. I am one of the two people writing the news section. Uh, yeah, so I'm here to help you guys learn the basics of journalism. Hi guys, uh, my name is Lenore and I'm the creative director at The Link. Um, I'm here to kind of talk about the visual side of uh, the publication and how how that rolls and give you some tips and tricks about how to do it efficiently and in a fun way. Hey folks, uh, I'm Nicholas. I'm the video editor here and I'll be speaking with Nanor a little bit about video at the link. Great. Um, so I guess uh, Nanor will use screen share. Um, Nanor, do you think uh, you could just very quickly visit our website? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Let me just get on that. As Nanor does that, uh, Elias, what, what are your thoughts on, on what's the news section all about? Well, um, you know, I've always tried to kind of figure that out for myself. Um, most importantly, I want the news section to be a resource. Um, nowadays, the biggest history textbook in the world is the internet. So it's always important to, um, you know, accurately have a record of what's going on in the community that you report on, be it Concordia or Montreal. Um, I feel like having um, a proper news section is a real asset, not just to any newspaper, but also just any community. Because again, it is, you know, when you when you get that kind of trust and sort of authority in terms of telling the truth and telling what's going on, um, you become sort of a record. So when people have questions, aren't sure what's going on, anything like that, you then turn to it as a sort of guide as to what's going on, what you missed. Uh, and I think that's a very big responsibility and it's one that, you know, I do enjoy the challenge of. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun too. It's a lot of fun, don't forget that. Writing news is great. Uh, that's for sure. And obviously a lot goes in our news section, but we also have um, an art section uh, for people who are interested in music or theater or visual art or whatever it is. Uh, we cover events. Um, we do a lot of like kind of covering behind the event type of thing. Um, Elias is also a, a former sports editor. Um, I understand sports is in a bit of a bad way at the moment. Well, there, there's no there's no um, university sports going on now, so that's a decent chunk of our coverage uh, cut off. We were, you know, we covered every single varsity stingers team last year and the year before that and now there's nothing really to cover so it'll it'll be an interesting challenge but you know we got a hell of a sports team too so uh it'll be interesting to see what what goes on but um olivia nevin who's the uh the sports editor now is more than capable so that'll also be fun to see what's going on sounds good um nanora is our screen share ready to go Yes, it cool. is. Um, hopefully, okay. Let's see. 
Okay, you guys have to let me know if it's um, working properly. One second. Okay, do you see my screen now? Do I don't. Website? Oh, wait. Okay. Coming. Okay. Do you see it? Yes, awesome. we do. Great. This is the link. So do you wanna, where do you want to start off? Um, let's not take too much time here, but maybe just like people can see it. And, and maybe we could check out the magazine very quick as well. Okay. Uh, the link and is so here is uh, our first issue of the year. If we were in school right now, you would be seeing this issue all over the place. It's not loading. Okay. Uh, Nanora, would you like to speak to our magazine and how it um, is kind of complementary to what we do every day? Uh, yeah, so uh, our magazine is, uh, we transitioned to a quarterly magazine format, so we publish uh, four times a year. Um, and m we decided this year to go um, to be a digital first uh, publication. Um, so in, in the magazine, um, all the content is, uh, revolves around one theme. So for the first one, we decided to go, um, as we do, um, every year to have an orientation issue, but we went with disorientation this year, given the current circumstances of, you know, student life and basically everyone's life everywhere in the world. Um, and we kind of ha try to have a very wide variety of coverage for this, um, can everyone hear, can you guys hear me properly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we have, you know, things um, like frosh and making friends at school and, you know, what university life is like uh, for incoming students, but also, um, you know, all, all types of um, students and depending on what situ situation they're in. Um, so we try to keep the coverage for these, you know, relevant to reflect what's going on in, um, like in our lives for, the students of Concordia, but also all around Montreal. Um, we decided to have our a, a fiction piece in the magazine for the first time, which was a very nice addition to our magazine. Um, again, this is sports section. Um, we had a piece that did very well on gentrification and how students impact gentrification in Montreal. Um, we also decided to include satire for the first time in our magazine which um, was a very nice refreshing break to you know heavier features and um, more long form and serious content um, so yeah that was this was our first magazine and uh, yeah I was very happy with it we it was a great great like team effort and I think it went super well yeah um, right. where so should I go on the website you know what the last thing before we start the presentation is why don't you just go to our about page at the at the top mm -hmm. yes uh what i really want to emphasize um other than the little okay. kind of tips and tricks that can help you along is that we are very very accessible and welcoming and you do not have to be shy like you don't have to come to us like ready to be an expert or anything like that um, you don't even need to come to us with an idea necessarily um, you can just come to us and say i'm interested in what's going on and, and i want to get involved and we can take it from there so if you visit our about page you'll you'll find all of our editors are listed here as well as their email address and i 
invite you to contact any editor, including myself, um, that you might have a question for. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we launch into the good old fashioned PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the link has kind of a long-standing reputation as a bit of a newspaper with an activist slant. Uh, we were a print newspaper for most of our publications lifespan. And it's still what we do online, basically. Um, so we're especially um, focused on kind of advocacy journalism and stuff like that. Um, so on that note, why student journalism? Uh, why should you get involved? Uh, it's an opportunity to have an impact on your community. Uh, we cover both Concordia as well as Montreal in general, especially stuff that's not too mainstream. Um, so, you know, when you get your byline out there and, and hundreds of people or more are reading it, um, you know, you have an opportunity to kind of have your footprint that way um, and make an impact. Um, it can enrich your student experience. Obviously right now is a really weird time that we're all adjusting to. And especially if you're new at Concordia, you might be wondering like how to immerse yourself in Concordia without actually being there. Um, it's challenging. Uh, you don't get the chance to meet your classmates face to face. Um, so it's also a really good way to get involved in student life. Um, it can also help you build a portfolio, um, which can also be valuable for you. Um, in general, journalism is great for kind of just getting in the mix. You know, you meet a lot of people you, you wouldn't normally, you go to a lot of places you wouldn't normally. Um, so it's great for that. And so, you know, it's, it's always a, a good idea to get involved in things like this. And as our encouraging speech bubble, is there to assure you, you can do this. Um, Nanora, will you please change to the next slide? Mm -hmm. um, okay, could we actually go back to the previous slide? Yes, of course. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not done with this slide because I want to expand on why you might want to build a portfolio. Um, you might get involved with us and find as we do that journalism's great and you know you want to pursue that um but you know like you can build writing samples that are useful for any field you want to get involved in you can build your communication skills you can show that you work well with others um and also expanding on our encouraging thought bubble um the skills that you have um, if you think about it, I mean, most of us are on social media. That's all about documenting the world around us. Um, you know, taking note of what's going on, analyzing what's going on and sharing it publicly. Uh, every phone is a camera for photo or video. Uh, even your school experience, like an article is not an essay, um, not least because it's more interesting uh, to write and read most of the time. Um, but you know, like you're still doing the, doing the work of, of taking different strands and, and combining them into a form that makes the most sense to communicate your ideas. Um, and so I think, you know, by this time, most people have some comfort doing that. And if you can do that, then you can write an article. Um, so I did want to leave you with that. And finally, like we're all used to having conversations, getting to know other people's points of view. And really, I mean, like the most important skill you can have as a journalist is a sense of empathy, a desire to see where other people are coming from. And so if you have that, then you're also very well equipped to take a dive into this type of thing. 
Um, Nanora, may you now please switch the slide for me. Thank you. Um, a journalist has got to be curious, keep their eyes and ears open, and basically ask what's up, what's going on. So, you know, and who's behind what's going on. Um, so I would encourage anybody who wants to get involved to try to lean into looking at the world like that. These are just a few kinds of basic stories that you could get involved in. Um, a lot of stories are just straight up news. Um, most articles you read will be in this format. It's basically what happened, filtering through what happened. Um, actually, that work is a bit more creative than it sounds because you know it's up to you as the journalist to um, to synthesize that information and also uh, to uh, add context as well. That's an, another very important part of our job. Um, so like you're far from a tape recorder when you're doing straight up news, uh, but it's basically just like the basic format. You know, we do a lot like this, like, you know, 500 words, sometimes less. Um, so that's straight up news. And then features is your chance to get a little more creative. Uh, you'll often use anecdotes. Often we'll even start these stories with an anecdote. You know, you meet, uh, you meet a subject who's doing something interesting um, or is compelling for whatever reason. And you'll talk to them a bit about their experience, what they do, their lives. And, you know, you might come away with, with a story that they tell you that, that kind of encapsulates it. Um, you want to use sensory details, put the reader on the scene. Um, it has a lot in common with creative writing, other than the fact that everything's true. Um, so this kind of story can be quite interesting. It's a lot more labor intensive. It's, it's usually longer. You speak to more people. Um, but it's a very exciting um, form of journalism. And finally, we publish opinions pieces. <clears throat> which is kind of an approachable way to get involved. Um, it's still timely in the sense that, you know, it has to be the right time for the piece, like what, what makes the piece interesting now? And, you know, what makes you the person to, um, to write this piece? Like why are people interested in your point of view on this subject? Uh, but if you can answer those two questions, you're in a really good position to make an opinions piece. So we have an opinions editor who can, you know, who's exclusively on that and, and she can help you with that. And she's very nice. So I encourage you to do that as well. Journalistic writing. I believe at this point we are handing it over to Elias. Yes, hi. All right, so um, for those you don't know, my name is Elias. I am the co-news editor for the link, of course. Um, Nor if you just want to hit the mm -hmm. next slide. So writing for journalism is not really like writing for an essay. I got into journalism because I used to like to write mainly essays. And then it kind of, it is a bit of a 180 in terms of your mentality and uh, how you go about breaking down every single aspect of a story. But a lot of the, the skills you learn while writing essays in terms of um, writing with color and writing with purpose are easily transferable into this domain. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the news brief, the news brief which is basically the um, chicken and rice of journalism. It is very much at the core of every other piece you're going to write in some way, shape, or form for the rest of your career. Um, whether it be you know your lead, the way it's organized, everything we're gonna be talking about now is a an important aspect of a, a a regular news brief. But you will take it with you in every single thing, whether you're doing features, whether you're doing opinions, whether you're doing even sports recaps. All these techniques will come up throughout your career. The first one is the lead. Uh, traditionally, it is the first sentence of your article. Sometimes it comes in second or third. That is called a buried lead. Um, that comes with experience, and then you can get 
you know, more comfortable with experimenting with different styles of writing. But more often than not, in a standard news brief, it is just the first thing. And that sentence is ideally as much information as you could physically pack in answering four main questions, which is who, what, where, and when. Why and how are two also very important questions, but those come later. The four that you have to answer are in that sentence. That being said, not every single um, question, who, what, where, and when, have the same amount of importance. More often than not, who and what are the two things you start with, because you always want to start with an action. So um, this may seem a bit dark, but this is the first one that almost any student in Concordia Journalism has has um, begun their, their classes with is basically um, two people died in a house fire in De Montagne last week or last night. That may be a bit dark, but that is your standard lead. It starts off with who, what happened, where did it happen, and when. That is, that may sound a bit dry, and that may sound a bit, you know, bare bones, but that is the first sentence. So the way that that works is if someone were to open this article and only read the first line, would they still know what the article is about? And that is the most important part. Moving on, you have um, the way you organize your story, which is equally important because it's something we use called the inverted pyramid, which means you stack as much important and crucial information at the top. And then as you go down the inverted pyramid, it becomes more and more contextual, becomes less and less uh, pressing about what it is the story is about in the present time. So the first two or three paragraphs are with as much uh, information as possible about what exactly happened. So if we're continuing with the fire analogy, where exactly in De Montagne, um, what time did it happen? Stuff that wouldn't necessarily make the lead, but is still pertinent to the story. When did first responders get on the scene? Stuff like that. Your next paragraph is called uh, a nut graph, which is, I just learned like two weeks ago, is actually called a nut, a short for a nutshell graph, which is, um, you know, three years in journalism is the first time I've ever learned that. But a nutshell graph is normally three or four paragraphs in, and this is where you start to expand. And this is something that's extremely important in advocacy journalism because you're asking questions like, why is this important? What does this mean to people? How are people going to perceive this? And at the end of the situation, especially in a case like this or the case of the, the story we're discussing, where do we go from here? And when you are an advocacy paper, like the link is, it's very much based on, you know, contextualizing information because we are, to the best of our abilities, we are not stenographers. We have to put you, put our readers in a situation where they understand what's happening and not just throw a bunch of information at them and then hope they get it, right? So we have to tell people, why this is important, why this matters, and why people should be happy or outraged depending on the story. So in the case of uh, our, our fire story, it would be stuff like, um, if it took too long for first responders to get on the scene, why? Uh, you would have quotes from either family or first responders, stuff like that to add color to the text. Not necessarily stuff that if someone doesn't read they'll miss the gist of the story. But if they do continue to read and get to that paragraph, they then are able to maybe deepen their knowledge of, of what happened. Um, that That's also why it's extremely important for um, privacy papers. Moving on from that, um, features and like Marcus said earlier, opinions and even, you know, recaps sort of take that same, um, that same format, but not always. For example, a feature is more of a long form piece. So you are allowed to take detours. You are allowed to um, add other pieces of information that you could find help the story flow. May not be as directly important, but they do help the story grow in a more organic way. Um, moving on, we have uh, the interviewing. The link is going to have a workshop on, um, a full workshop on how to interview because um, giving it just one little bit really doesn't do it justice. It really is an art form. So uh, you guys ha will have to look out for that. But in a nutshell, interviewing is wildly subjective. So every single st story style, whether it's a feature, a, a regular news brief, or a recap, um, depends on your relationship 
with the subject depends on your subject relationship with the publication because we i've had interviews with people that i've had i've never spoken to in my life but maybe have been you know don't necessarily have the best relationship with the link so it always gets a bit testy but every interview is different you can't you can't approach an interview going like i did this i will carbon copy it and do it this i'll get the exact same result because you will be very surprised with how people approach and how people react to um reporters preparation is very important when you're in an interview um but not everyone prepares the same for example uh, what i prefer to do is have a bunch of main questions that i have prepared that i used to fall back on and then i use the majority of my questions are follow-ups based on what my source just said so for example i'll have like five or six big topics that i want to talk about and then i'll maybe write down some more of the important follow-up questions that i want to touch on but a lot of them will be reactions or asking for them to further their comment on what they just said not everyone's the same some people like to have every single question they plan to ask planned out other people tend to uh, go with the flow again that is entirely up to you and as you you know interview more and more people you sort of figure out what your style is and you sort of figure out what makes you the most comfortable and what makes um what makes you get the best questions out of someone because sometimes in the heat of the action you'll forget so you want to have everything prepared and sometimes if you have too many questions you'll feel overwhelmed and then you'll try and skip over stuff and then you'll end up regretting that you didn't ask a question so the more you interview and the more people you interview the, the different kind of people you interview the more you'll be able to narrow down how you operate when it comes to actually physically interviewing the person i always like to take notes have timestamps. it just makes my um my writing process easier that being said and i learned this the hard way you do have to actively listen if it's a phone interview or if it's even if it's a zoom interview nowadays um it's a bit easier to take notes and actively listen but if you're interviewing someone in person they will not respond well to someone who has their you know their head buried in a notepad taking notes and not really making eye contact so you could hear everything your interviewer is saying but all the interviewee sees is just a reporter with their face in their notes not really listening you know even if it's just a no you don't have to audibly respond i do that sometimes and it's a little bit awkward but even if it's just a nod and eye contact it it reinforces the fact that you're listening to the to the interview and it doesn't feel like they're just saying whatever because no one's listening um so it's always important you know because that also helps build a connection with your your interview subject lastly on 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 interviewing um always make sure you have at least a vague idea of how it's going to go down you can never fully plan out an interview you'll always get one or two answers that'll raise an eyebrow and then will kind of force you to redirect which is why it's important to have a broad stroke strategy on how things will go down you know you can't you can't read the future and tell them exactly what they're going to answer and then plan everything but you know if i you could be like if i ask them this question this is what they're most likely going to answer and i can build from there so that brings us to selecting quotes because you know, I've had interviews that have run as long as an hour, an hour and a half, which means that it is impossibly difficult to fit everything in. It is impossible to fit everything in unless you're, you know, doing a straight question and answer piece. So what I do, again, takes me back to my notes and my timestamps, because I will know that, you know, at this point in the interview, they were talking about this bit. So while I'm writing a piece, I know exactly where to find what I'm looking for. Um, it's not just about getting information out of people and then directly plugging as much physical like statistics or information into a quote as possible. Sometimes you're using it just for color. So sometimes you could do it just to sort of refresh the reader's eyes because if they see too much of one person's voice, they lose interest and then they'll just leave the page or they'll just skip ahead or they'll just zone out. So having voices not only adds color to a piece, but it also keeps the reader interested. Um, it also makes it so that you don't overload too much on facts because every single writer is guilty of, at one point or another, just to putting too much information into a piece to the point where it becomes a research essay. And that's not always what's going to click best with the reader depending on your publication. But again, you know, if it's just a standard news piece, even a news feature, 
it will be very difficult to just keep a right reader's attention with just too much data. So quotes are meant to, you know, expand on something. It's meant to also add credibility because the people you're interviewing are experts in their field, first-hand witnesses, stuff like that. So they are meant to um, not only make it more interesting, but also make it more credible. Um, and that brings us all to throwing it all together. You will often, you know, either trade notes on your writing process or tra trade ideas on how every single person goes about writing a piece. The most important thing, like most of the stuff we just spoke about, is figuring out what works for you. There is no one set way to write a piece once you're done. You can, um, I'm guilty of this sometimes, I don't necessarily transcribe all my interviews. That's why I take so many notes during my interviews and how I do timestamps. But I found that out by doing as many interviews and writing as many stories as possible, because then I find out what I'm comfortable with and what what enables me to do my best work. Uh, yeah, so if Nanora will change the slide, we have a little activity for you guys. That So what you guys can see there is, uh, I'm going to give you guys some information uh, in the following slide and you have five minutes to write me a solid lead. So if you wanna switch the slide one more time. This is 10 points of information. Um, I want, this is all taken from an article we wrote about the Black Lives Matter protest over the summer. I want you guys to write a lead using that information alone and what we just spoke about in this workshop. And you guys can, um, if you guys are comfortable with it, we can, you can throw your leads in the chat and then I can take a look at them, see where it went right, see where it went wrong and sort of tweak it as the way I would if I were editing an article. So if you guys want to take like five minutes to to do that and then you could just throw your leads in the chat and we could have a look at them. I would add as well that um, following following that, so we're gonna have the visual part of our presentation from Nanor and we also have a couple of announcements that will interest you if if you're if you're into getting involved. So um, I just wanted to say that before we go into our five minutes. I see some new people just got into the chat. Um, for those of you who don't know, what's on the PowerPoint right now are 10 pieces of information. And from that, uh, you guys have to write a lead, which is basically just um, the most important point, the most important pieces of an article, the bare bones of it, ask, answering the question, who, what, where, and when. So if you guys wanna throw your answers in the chat, that'd be really cool.
All right, we're gonna, if you guys still have your leads, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we can get to them later. But now we're going to be looking uh, at the principles of visual journalism and photojournalism with the one and only Nanur. Cool. Um, hi, guys. So, um, okay, first I want to talk uh, about some uh, some things I think, you know, anyone who's interested in um, contributing to the link should know about, you know, photojournalism and kind of um, what will be expected of you at the link. But also, if you're interested in doing photo for um, any news organization. Um, so at the link, you'll most of the time you are like writing an article uh, covering an event. Um, we will ask you if you you're you know um, able to take your own pictures and if you are willing to do so. Uh, if not, obviously we have like a a good like team of um, photographers and a great photo editor who always you know who's in charge of signing um, people to take photos, but. Um, it's always a good skill to have um, alongside of writing to be able to manage um, the visual side of a story. Um, and most of the time, it's very useful to be able to do both because in the real world, as our teachers say, um, you know, you, uh, journalists are expected to be to be multimedia experts in a way. You know, you you sh you like you're expected to be able to write, edit. Uh, your articles, take your own photos, take your own video, and, you know, be able to put everything together, everything that you will need for a story by yourself. Um, yes, usually, you know, you work in teams, you have a cameraman or a teammate, but it's also a very practical and useful skill to have. Um, and, you know, just the basics, if you know the basics, you will be able to build off of that and, you know, become great if you practice and, you know, you put in the time and effort and, just like everything, you know, it's it's a skill that takes practice to learn, to refine, and, you know, to get better at. So let us begin. Um, the two golden rules, these are two things that um, that really stuck with me, like from all the lectures and, you know, um, all the presentations and uh, classes that we've had over the past two years, and also a uh, seminar that I went to uh, hosted by a CBC photojournalist who's based in Vancouver. His name is Ben Nelms. We're going to see some of his pic, uh, some of his photographs. Two of the golden rules or the two key takeaways that I cannot stress enough, like kind of guidelines to having great pictures is to, first of all, have something usual with an unusual approach. And what I mean by that, well, we're going to see some examples. Um, but, you know, there is so much content going around in the world and you know we we've we can say that we've seen everything, um, but I think what will what's going to make something memorable uh, and relatable um, is giving your audience something that they're used they're used to seeing, but through a different lens, through a different perspective, and that can be very literally. So literally through a different angle, something that you know is gonna like is gonna seem weird maybe at first. Um, or more metaphorically, something that, um, you know, capturing something that where you, oh, sorry, um, I'm going to restart. Sometimes, you know, you, you go to an event and you're, you, would, you have an expectation of what you're going to see. But sometimes a photographer is going to look elsewhere, is going to look like, uh, is going to look at the audience members where usually the spotlight is on the players, you know, it, let's say for a sports event. So looking around, looking at the entire, um, I want to say landscape, but the entire place that you, where you are and kind of capturing what's around it and not necessarily where everyone's looking will kind of allow you to gain more perspective on what you can shoot and what you can take pictures of. Um, and the second part is to capture human emotion. Um, if you look at some of the best photographs and the ones that have won, you know, the... Um, World Press Photo Exhibit Prizes, the annual photo of the year. A lot of them, they convey so much emotion. And um, that can be, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, an angry face or a screaming face, but it sometimes it can be very calm, very serene and discreet. Um, but emotion always comes through and it's always something that's going to make someone look at a photo twice. Um, and it's very important to, add some sort of dynamic element to the picture, um, to the photograph. So this is a great photograph. Um, it's the, it's, I'm, I think it's called the Vancouver Riot Kiss. 
Um, but again, this is something that you would not expect to see at a riot. When you think of a riot, of a protest, manifestation, cities burning down, um, or whatever, like when you think of an upheaval, you think you expect to see fire, people running, people screaming, but you don't expect to see uh, two people kissing, lying down on the street, you know? So, and then there's the, the cop that's in the foreground of the picture. And it's just such a great, um, unexpected photograph to have when you're covering a riot. And I believe this picture was taken by accident. Uh, I remember um, Ben Nelms was talking about this picture during his presentation and um, it just really stuck with me. So I went and I found it. Um, but the photographer, I, he was saying that the photographer who uh, captured this moment, he he was kind of in the moment and putting down his camera at some point and then accidentally it clicked and it captured this. And the next day it was all over the the news and you know it was kind of a surprise to him because it was a very unexpected shot for him as well uh this is another one that i really like um you know when you think of nuns if you close your eyes and you picture nuns you don't pick you don't imagine them drinking a beer so at this event i believe it was a sports event um you know you have a chance to see things differently and it's something that the audience is going to remember because it is so unusual uh in in many ways and um, yeah, that's a really funny one. Uh, this is another one. Um, usually when, for more, I, I wanna say dry events, let's say a press conference or um, a speech, um, things like that, that don't really have a lot of action going on. Um, using your camera in a different, to, to give a different perspective of an event uh, or of a speaker can be very, very, um, you know, practical. Um, so, you know, if you think of a speech, again, it's going with the, you, you would expect to see a speaker by the microphone, maybe a few uh, heads from the audience in the foreground, and then there's, you know, the speaker and at the end by the, by the stage. But you won't expect to see a behind the scenes. I, this was taken behind the scenes. And as you can see, the PowerPoint, whatever was going to be on the PowerPoint or presentation is kind of on uh, Stephen Harper's face. So again, kind of, and having the red, it kind of gives, I mean, th this is my interpretation, but it kind of reminds you of the devil or something, you know, dark, um, you know, not very lighthearted in a way. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of nuanced things that photography allows you to do. And another point I wanna stress um, for photography, but also for graphics and illustrations, uh, that accompany articles is that there they anything that's visual can convey so much information with um you know just by one look of looking at it you know the, the famous saying is one, a picture is worth a thousand words and i always encourage writers to convey as much information as they can through their pictures instead of the writing and leave um the writing for the things that cannot necessarily be visualized but using any sort of visual support for an article in an efficient way is so um, important because that's what really captivates the reader. When they, when they go through to the website and look at an article, the first thing that pops up is the picture. And that's when they kind of decide like, am I gonna read or not? Like not all the time, but you know, if it's interesting, they will, they will read it even if the picture doesn't necessarily captivate them. But it plays such an important role um, as a component of that like I consider an article like there's a written part and the visual part and they really go hand in hand. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Like the audience has an image that they expect to see, uh, like I said, with the politician, with the riots. Um, and the best thing you can do is give them that, but in a way that they don't expect it. Um, so now a few other things I wanna cover are about composition and color. Um, so some of the, I'm going to go over some of the main rules, the basics that we learn. Um, so the rule of thirds, um, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard about that. So it's kind of dividing a picture in a grid of three. So three vertical lines and three horizontal lines. And if you imagine that grid right now, this picture really fits within that grid. And this picture is really amazing for so many other reasons. And another one is kind of it guides the eye from the bottom uh, right corner to the upper left corner. 
and having some sort of um, direction and diagonals and a dynamic in the picture is very um, captivating. You know, when you see that, you it it just makes it much more visually interesting and you want to look at it, you want to continue looking at it and then you see the first element and when you look at the picture again you notice so many different things um so yeah that's a great picture for that uh, another one is for colors um our teachers always you know encourage us to have complementary colors as best we can um in this picture you the colors are not that um clear but you can tell there's the orange and the blue which are complementary colors um, just like red and green and purple and yellow. So it's always good to keep that in mind whenever you're taking a picture of a scene, try to see what's in the background, see what you can incorporate to make whatever you're capturing as interesting as you can. Um, so yeah, keep it, colors are super, super important. Uh, another one is this picture by Bar Barbara Davidson. Um, a great picture for composition again if you look at it if you try to apply the grid here the rule of, uh, of thirds uh this would again fit within that grid and this is a again this kind of um uh this picture has you know the human emotion but it's also very calm you know we see the tear but she's she's resting her head on um uh i think it looks like a windowsill um and it's just a picture that you can keep looking at and every time you you would keep seeing more things um and also another thing that i want to talk about uh, regarding composition is having some sort of lines sometimes the lines are right there like with this with the with the blinds of the the curtain um and sometimes like the, this picture the line is not there but you do see that diagonal line with the hand and the cross it's guiding your eye through the picture uh in in this case the blinds are vertical, it's very clear and you see it immediately. Um, but that just makes for a very interesting composition. Um, another interesting composition trick is having a triangle in the picture. Um, so here we see the, the three boys and if you draw like a line from each of their heads to connect them all, um, you will see a triangular shape pop up there. And that kind of, again, it creates some sort of, it creates a dynamic, it adds a dynamic dimension to the picture and it's starting from the bottom and then it guides your eyes to the to the top of the frame, um, which again, it's more interesting and the, the guy in the front is um, in focus and then it's there's a nice depth of field with the, the one in the background. So keeping those things in mind, there's always an interesting way to capture something and there's all, there's always um, for a lack of a better word, a boring way to capture something. So keeping your eye out for however you can make it more interesting, however you can show your audience something in a different way um, will always go a long way. Um, and to end on a final note about photo, um, if the world ever goes up in flames, go to a golf course. There's always something interesting in a golf course. Um, I remember um, one of my teachers talked about this and um, apparently golfers don't really care if the world is exploding. Um, they, they stay there. This is not a, um, an edited picture. It's real. Um, I don't know how, but it's, that is what happens. So <laughs> that's a good tip for you guys. Um, if you guys ever need something and there's a fire, go to a golf course and people will be very calm. Um, and, also, this reminds me of something else that's very important about photo, journalistic um, photography, so photojournalism, um, is context. It's so important as a photojournalist to not edit your pictures in a way that would alter the information in the picture, to not crop it in a way, usually we never crop pictures. Um, that's kind of against um, for kind of the rules of photojournalism, I would say. Um, you always keep the picture as um, as raw as possible. Uh, obviously, editing, adjusting colors, even then some people would um, be completely against that. Some teachers or people just don't want us to retouch our pictures. But yeah, the, the, import the importance of context is um, not to be ignored for photojournalism. Just to be able to, 
to just like in an article, you want to provide the facts and you don't want to alter the any part of the story. And it, that applies in the same way to a photo. Um, so yeah, keep it real. Great. So we're going to move on to story generating and pitching. Marcus? Sorry, I had the mute going. Oh, no worries. Um, Great. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, basically, um, story generation and pitching is kind of like where it begins. Um, however, like our editors are constantly generating stories and, and pitching them. So, like, I want to be clear that. Um, you don't have to have an idea to get involved. Um, however, um, I mean, ideas are like a very important fundamental thing. Like there's no journalism without them. And if you can come up with your own idea, I mean, you might be more invested or you might think of an idea other people wouldn't think of. I mean, like experience is not always what, what makes for a good idea. Sometimes it's perspective. Um, so yeah, so basically like stories are everywhere. Um, be aware of what's going on. I would recommend, you know, reading the news, read different sources, um, you know, read the publication you want to get involved with. In this case, the link, we hope. Um, you know, and think what's another angle? What could be followed up on? You know, keep, keep an ear out when you're out and about like, um, ears and eyes open is what it's all about. And really, um, what they drill into us at journalism school and which is really true. And I think really quite accessible is curiosity is like the most fundamental attribute when it comes to ideas, you know, like if you approach the world in a curious way, like you're already three quarters of the way there, you know, it's about asking questions and looking for the answers and so you know and then you also want to think you know why should people care um think about who you're trying to speak to like what's the audience when you're writing for the link the audience is generally concordia students although not necessarily uh, we have readership elsewhere but you know it might skew younger um more with it um and basically um you really want to be thinking about who you're speaking to and then like on another note um you want to think about how you're going to say something in a fresh way or a new way in our case um we often think, how can we take this general thing that's interesting and put it into a Concordia context? How can we put it into a, you know, a local Montreal context? Um, that's like kind of a very successful formula for us and really for anything, you know, and that's where knowing your readership comes in. Um, could we move to the next slide, please, Anna? Oh, apparently I had slides for that, so. But I already went over that, so oh, if we continue. Get involved. Pitch meetings. We have them every day, every Thursday at 5.30, including today. Today is, in fact, our magazine pitch meeting, um, which is a rare treat. Uh, we're planning the food issue. If you have any food-related ideas, the way that food connects to all kinds of other areas, uh, we want to hear your ideas. Um, well, but at, at the pitch meetings, our editors will also pitch ideas to you. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, it's pretty chill. Like you don't have to feel intimidated about going. Um, however, it's not the only way to get involved. You can always email us. Um, we are a learning space as well. Like you might notice we've tried to place some emphasis on, um, learning and it's not only because it's a workshop um learning happens all the time like we're learning all the time our contributors are learning um 
we have lots of alumni at the link. Um, a lot of talented people go through the link and continue to stay involved. And we have frequent workshops offered through the link uh, for free. Um, so, and we also offer guidance. Like you don't have to have learned everything in this presentation. We're here to help basically. Uh, so on September 25th, which is not tomorrow, but the following Friday, we're having a link alum, Justin Giovanetti, giving a workshop on story generation. So you'll have the opportunity to learn more about this. Uh, he used to be with the Globe and Mail. Uh, now he is with an outlet in New Zealand. Um, so we're excited about that. I hope you'll attend that. Um, and we're going to follow that on October 1st with kind of a, a special pitch meeting. So you can take what, you know, hopefully you learned today and what you're going to learn on the 25th if you attend. And, you know, usually the pitch meetings are centered around us pitching to you. But on this occasion, the focal point is going to be participants pitching to us. So that's another opportunity to kind of challenge yourself. Um, but really, the important thing is kind of that leap of faith that, that you have to take. And, and I think I could speak for each of my colleagues when I say, like, we've all found this endeavor very rewarding. Um, you know, for me, like I said, I've been to university twice. And the second time was a lot different than the first time. I can tell you that. And a big part of it is because of getting involved with this. Um, so PowerPoint-wise, is the PowerPoint done? Is there another slide after that? Nope. That is what we have. OK. Well, <laughs> it's exactly 2 o'clock, which is? Uh, before, sorry, we do, before we, we do have the yes, Nicholas. Chat. Oh, yes. OK. So we're going to have Nicholas yeah. speak about, um, uh, he's going to say a word about getting involved with video. OK. Um, and then Elias is going to have a coda on his lead presentation. OK, I'll stop sharing the screen um, so we can see Nicholas. Is that OK? Is that great? Awesome. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, most of the things that, that, that Nanora was talking about with, uh, with the visual side of the link in general applies also to video. Um, video is kind of an interesting thing because it takes the skills that you would use for things like graphics and photography um, and applies them to this medium that's obviously about motion, it's about sound, um, and there's a whole another layer of like story creation. Um, whereas photos and graphics tend to accompany articles and like give them flavor, uh, a lot of our video work um, serves as like standalone stories, um, which is both like more challenging, but also in terms of say, a portfolio piece, uh, more rewarding and can kind of, it's, it speaks for a lot. Um, so uh, anyone who's interested in getting involved with video, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us or to me specifically. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to learn. You don't, have to, um, you don't have to know all these things of like editing and shooting video. Like it's something that you can learn over time. Uh, and we usually work uh, in partners, um, you know, obviously as safely as possible these days. Um, and it's, yes, yeah, so you don't have to, my point being, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a, a, a writer uh, to get involved with the link. You can be involved with photo, graphics, or video. Um, and video is a, a, a great outlet for anyone who wants to work on portfolios. Um, it complements like most creative professions um, in journalism and beyond, uh, people are always, always want people who can produce videos, whether you're like working for a company, um, or a nonprofit or something like it's a super useful skill. So, um, feel free to reach out to me personally. Um, and we can uh, get you started if you're interested. Um, okay. Marcus, you're muted. Sorry. I feel safer on mute. I think I don't really have to keep going on mute, but um, so we're we're gonna post a link in the chat, FYI, uh, if you want to sign up to get invitations to our pitch meetings, which are online, obviously, right now. Um, and then I'm sorry, Nanora, I believe I I might have interrupted you. Uh, uh no, it's fine. Uh, it's all good. Okay. Well, in that case, I'll hand it to Elias. Yeah, so we have um, we have two leads in the chat. 
Um, both, you know, answering all four questions, which is um, which is really nice. Um, one thing I will I, I will add is that it, again, it is very subjective, depending on who you're writing for. So if you're writing for someone like the link, uh, where it's implied that we cover the Concordia Montreal area, you don't really want to say your location as Montreal. You want to do something more specific, like la vida. Um, that being said, when it comes to protest coverage, the f the first thing that always needs to be written or always needs to be included is how many people. Um, the fact that you guys included the tear gas and you guys included the peaceful protesters um, is good. I mean, the, the 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 biggest thing that would need to be changed on these in these leads are the fact that there were there's no numbers. Um, yeah, so just always remember to include if you're covering a protest or anything like that, that you do so and you include um, how many people were there. Other than that, though, it's it's a good start. So, and it's okay, Monica. We're all rusty. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Is uh? Can people see the the link in the chat? I, I don't see a link in the chat, Marcus. Sorry. Okay, we're just going to make sure we get that uh, posted. And I'm trying to just. Oh, I know why. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Um, cool. Uh, so, Nanor, do we have anything else? Um, there's one uh, thing that our graphics editor sent us, um, and it's about, um, you know, when sometimes we need, we don't have a photo for um, a, a specific article, um, we go to him, you know, we're like, hey, can you make us a graphic? And sometimes it's really not um, obvious uh, to have a graphic for something. Uh, and I'm going to show share my screen real quick to show you an article that um, Joey made a graphic for. He's our graphics editor. Um, hold up one second. Okay. You got this article? Do you guys see my screen? I do. Oh, it's coming up. Do you see it? No. I'm not sure if it's working. It is working. It is? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so I asked him for an example of uh, a graphic that was not obvious to come up with, not easy to come up with. Um, and he really came through uh, for us for this article. And it's about um, provincial law that for, like still forbidding women to take their husband's surname uh, in Quebec. And we did not know what to do for this. But um, he came up with this graphic, which you know, we think is like super cool. And, you know, you you get the idea that it's, you know, a bride and a groom. And we see the Quebec, um, you know, the flag and the name. And I think it's just a very cool way to show something that, you know, would have been very hard to get on photo um, or almost impossible. Um, so yeah, the graphics um, um, editor is kind of in charge of, you know, finding alternatives to, like I said, like presenting an article, giving the article a visual component that um, is gonna be captivating. and still trying to convey some sort of information through the graphic, you know, um, any visual component has a useful and efficient side to it um, to try to, you know, give the reader a sense of what the article is about um, and also convey a tone um, with, you know, the use of color, the use of the style of the illustration or the graphic. There's a lot that can be conveyed through one picture and that's all up to the graphic artist. So. Uh, that's not all I wanted to touch on for that. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Great. Um, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so we hope you got something out of our presentation today. 
basically whether you've got kind of a visual or writing interest or, or both. Um, I hope this went some way to showing you that there's no reason to be intimidated. You have a lot of these skills that you'll need already. Um, and kind of your mindset is, is more important than any um, individual skill because those things can be worked on and, and we are here to work on it with you. Um, I believe there's a, a Google form in the YouTube chat if you want to sign up for our pitch meetings. If you don't see it, you can always email me at editor at the link newspaper.ca. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for spending an hour and nine minutes with us today. And I hope we shall um, see you soon, possibly today at 5.30 for our pitch meeting. You'll have a chance even to be in the magazine if you go today. Um, so please do. And unless somebody else has a word, um, I believe we will call it a CSU orientation workshop. Thank okay. you everyone for tuning in. Thank you.